welcome to another video on jazz. In this video we're going to be looking at Dixieland jazz and how Chicago became the centre of a growing jazz scene in the 1920s. The book I'm following for a foundation in all this jazz is the book here, Jazz for Dummies, and then building on this. There's not a lot of information on Dixieland jazz in this book so far, so I've done a brief Google search. <laughs> I always start these videos off really awkwardly, I do. Without further ado, let's begin. What is Dixieland? Well, according to Grove Music Online, it is a term applied to the jazz played by white musicians of the early New Orleans school, but sometimes also to New Orleans jazz as a whole and often to the post-1940 revival of this music, also known as traditional jazz. Owing to the absence of recorded evidence, the stylistic differences between early black jazz in New Orleans and its white counterpart played by groups such as Papa Jack Lanes and others is impossible to document. However, early commentators and observers are fairly unanimous in pointing out that white musicians were slower to grasp the rhythmic swing and blues inflections essential to jazz. Though at the same time, they made important contributions to its repertory and harmonic and melodic vocabulary. The name Dixieland derives from the original Dixieland Jazz Band, a white New Orleans group which became internationally successful through its tours and recordings. There's more. Britannica.com explains that New Orleans was not the only city where early jazz took root at the turn of the 20th century, but it was the centre of that musical activity and most of the seminal figures of early jazz, black and white, were active there. It is likely that both blacks and whites played the music that came to be known as Dixieland jazz. So already in this research into Dixieland jazz, it is evident to me that there is some sort of dichotomy or relationship between early black jazz and that of white musicians. So we get two varied yet similar, in a lot of ways, approaches to jazz music very early on in the development of jazz. And it seems to me that this variety is connected to the coming together of different cultural backgrounds that were present in New Orleans in the early 1900s. Now let's explore the sound of Dixieland in more detail so that we can see how it fits in with the development of jazz music and its sound as we know it today. According to neworleans.com, Dixieland jazz was developed in the early 20th century. It draws on four major influences, including ragtime, blues, gospel, and military brass bands. The biggest difference between what many consider traditional jazz and Dixieland jazz is Dixieland's use of collective improvisation. Instead of segmenting each musician with individual solos, Dixieland draws on the specificity of each instrument to create one unique and harmonious sound. So, in the coming together of ragtime, blues, gospel and military brass bands, we also have the coming together of various cultures, and vice versa. The distinction between black musicians and white musicians and their approach to jazz music is a crucial factor in the development of the Dixieland sound and is discussed quite prominently in the literature. It seems that the music of white musicians was much less experimental than that of black musicians, as Britannica.com explains here. Black and white musicians of New Orleans shared many common influences, although it would appear that white bands tended to draw on ragtime and European music, whereas black bands also built on their 19th century ethnic heritage. This distinction is illustrated in the styles of the city's two most popular musicians, Papa Jack Lane and Woody Bolden. Lane, a drummer who led bands in New Orleans from 1891, is often referred to as the father of white jazz. Specialising first in French and German marching music, his band by 1910 had converted almost entirely to ragtime. Nick La Roca, one of the many musicians who apprenticed with Lane, incorporated the sound and much of the repertoire of Lane's band when forming the original Dixieland Jazz, originally jazz, band, ODJB, in 1916. A highly influential group, the ODJB, also borrowed from the marching band tradition in employing the trumpet or cornet, clarinet and trombone as frontline instruments. The following year, the ODJB cut what is regarded as the first jazz record, Livery Stable Blues, which also became the first million-selling recording in history. This and subsequent original Dixieland jazz band recordings such as Tiger Rag, Dixie Jazz Band One Step and at the jazz band ball reflected the white style of playing. 
technically proficient but less experimental than black styles. As I keep saying, the reason for the different levels of experimentation between black and white musicians is most likely the result of their musical training and backgrounds. As explained in Britannica.com, white musicians drew on European musical influences such as marching band music, uh, whereas black musicians built on their ethnic heritage and their music was more experimental than that of white musicians. As we've already established from Grove Music Online, white musicians were slower to grasp the rhythmic swing and blues inflections essential to jazz. And this is presumably what black musicians incorporated into their jazz style. The approach that was more characteristic of black bands could be heard in the music of Buddy Bolden, known as the King to Uptown Residents. A flamboyant tragic figure with a prodigious appetite for women and whiskey, Bolden has been credited as the first jazz cornet player. His bold style showed blues influences as early as the 1890s in his use of bent notes and an overtly emotional style. He is also credited with establishing the tradition of group improvisation as well as being the primary influence on the young Louis Armstrong. Bolden, like other very early jazz figures, was never recorded. Yet traces of his style could probably be heard in the playing of such pioneering figures as Bunk Johnson and Sidney Bechet. So here we have more experimentation in the bending of notes and by incorporating improvisation there seems to be a heartfelt approach to just playing music in the black style than there is if you compare this to the white style which seems to be more about trained classical traditional skill. Just different approaches I guess. To me, it seems that the style of jazz performed by black musicians is much freer than that of white musicians who were apparently influenced more by military marching bands. I know if you think about it, this is very strict, neat music, isn't it? There's something a lot more regimented and less in the moment about the type of jazz white musicians played. And this sort of leaked into the way they wrote the music as well, understandably. Now there wasn't just a simple divide between black and white musicians in the New Orleans jazz scene, but Creole musicians also contributed to the development of jazz. Now a distinctive style of New Orleans jazz came to life in the merging of these different cultures and their music, as Britannica.com explains. New Orleans during the late 19th century was in effect two cities. Downtown was home to most whites and creoles, and uptown was home to freed black slaves. The strictness of the city's segregation was evidenced in 1897 with the establishment of Storyville, known as the District to Locals, a 38-square-block area designed to isolate such activities as prostitution and gambling that was split by Canal Street into black and white areas. Virtually every brothel, tavern and gambling hall in Storyville employed musicians. The unique urban culture of New Orleans provided a receptive environment for a distinctive new style of music. So here we have a seemingly segregation of cultures who were unavoidably influenced by each other, as we can tell from the coming about of a new jazz style in New Orleans and Chicago. We'll learn about Chicago in a moment. What I have deciphered so far is that we have this coming together of different cultures, and this led to a unique New Orleans style of music that came to be known as Dixieland. We have classically trained musicians combining their training in Western classical music with stylistic traits from black musicians, such as improvisation, gospel music, bending notes, and so on. We have this coming together of a more regimented marching band style of jazz and a freer, syncopated, improvised style. You could say that Dixieland jazz is a result of a collision of worlds. Now, we couldn't discuss Dixieland jazz without discussing the original Dixieland jazz band. According to Sutro, in this book, Although African-American musicians such as Louis Armstrong, Buddy Bolden, Sidney Vachet, Jelly Roll Morton and King Oliver were the players who created early jazz and spread its evolution, the all-white original Dixieland jazz band ODJB made the first jazz record. There's also a debate as to whether or not the original Dixieland jazz band contributed to jazz's development or not. Apparently, the lead cornetist, Nick La Roca, claimed to be jazz's inventor after the original Dixieland jazz band made their first jazz recording in New York in 1917. However, Sutra writes that the original Dixieland jazz band's music copied black jazz, though most experts agree that the original Dixieland jazz band produced no significant improvisation and didn't play a major part in jazz's invention. Sutro recommends that you listen to the original Dixieland jazz band's complete original Dixieland jazz band 1917-1936, which apparently gives an excellent overview of the band's music from 
livery stable blues with horns braying like barnyard animals to their version of St. Louis Blues. Have a listen. And now on to Chicago jazz. So as we have explained already, Dixieland is a style of jazz often described to jazz pioneers in New Orleans. However, it is also descriptive of styles honed by slightly later Chicago area musicians. So up until around now, ragtime had flourished in New Orleans. However, between 1910 and 1920, the music matured and as southerners moved north for jobs, jazz migrated to Chicago where bustling clubs and recording studios gave players a shot at fame. Sutra writes, Sidney Bechet, Johnny Dodds, Freddie Keppard, Jimmy Noon, King Oliver, Jelly Roll Martin and Louis Armstrong were key players in the migration. These musicians bridged the transition between early New Orleans jazz and 1920s Chicago. As they took in new influences, including classical music, the jazz they played in clubs grew more sophisticated. So there you have it. So what does Chicago jazz sound like and how is it different to Dixieland jazz? Well, how does Chicago jazz differ from New Orleans jazz and is it all called Dixieland? I don't know. Apparently it was in Chicago where Dixieland flourished. According to Britannica.com, with the closing of Storyville during World War I, Many New Orleans musicians who had relied on the district for employment moved elsewhere, many of them to Chicago, which became the next major urban centre of jazz. The form called Dixieland actually flourished and had its greatest success in Chicago. There were two important differences, however, in the city's styles. New Orleans music had continued to show the heavy influence of marching bands in its square rhythm and in its ensemble focus. The Chicago style incorporated more blues trademarks. The music emphasised the second and fourth beats, the off beats, in each measure, and the soloist came to the fore. Again here we have two distinct approaches to performing Dixieland, based on whether or not the music was performed in New Orleans or Chicago, or indeed whether or not it was developed in New Orleans or Chicago. In New Orleans jazz was more regimented, inspired by marching bands and band focused, whereas Chicago jazz incorporated a more bluesy feel and relaxed approach to rhythm, with a focus on soloists. Actually, it gets more interesting in terms of culture and stuff. Sutro calls this Chicago jazz South Side Black Jazz. So the differences in approach to Dixieland jazz is also likely to do again with the influence of different cultural backgrounds. And according to Sutro, this Chicago jazz had traits that distinguished it against its New Orleans counterpart. He writes that, like New Orleans jazz, South Side Black Chicago jazz had distinctive traits. Faster tempos, which prompted new, higher levels of musicianship and improvisation. Straightforward chord patterns that encouraged improvisation. A new cache of leading players, only some of whom could read music well, with a variety of personal styles, including Armstrong, Bechet, Dodds, Lil Harden, Earl Hines, Noon, Oliver, and Louis Russell. Louis Russell? Yes, that's interesting, actually. The, the idea that people couldn't read music may be also this had something to do with the development of different styles or approaches to jazz, and why maybe the ones more likely to be educated in Western classical music could perform music that was more regimented, whereas those who were perhaps self taught hadn't had that background or uh, that training in classical music, so they had no choice but to be more freer and improvise around what they heard would make sense. It's all still music. From what I've gathered during my research into this Dixieland era of jazz, the main traits that distinguish New Orleans jazz from Chicago jazz is solo improvisation. Britannica.com says a bit more about this as follows. <laughs> King Oliver, who moved from New Orleans to Chicago in 1918, made what are considered to be the first authentic New Orleans style jazz recordings with his Creole jazz band in 1923. Featuring the young Louis Armstrong on second cornet, the band exemplified the group improvisation approach to early jazz in which all members of the ensemble were free to embellish the melody. Particularly effective and of great interest to jazz historians are the cornet duets in which Armstrong played harmony to Oliver's lead. Their recording of Dipper Mouth Blues is a much heralded example. Within a few years, Armstrong would emerge as jazz's first great soloist and would influence many white Chicago area musicians in this regard. The white players of the Chicago school, Jimmy McPartland, Bud Freeman, Frank Tishimaka and Vic Spiderbeck, were the leading practitioners of solo improvisation, the trait that most distinguishes Chicago jazz from New Orleans jazz. 
I can only apologise if I'm mispronouncing everybody's name. Now, on to the revival of Dixieland Jazz. Of course, when we get to the 1930s, big band and swing takes over, and Dixieland falls by the wayside. However, there is a revival of Dixieland Jazz in the 1940s, and this to me would imply that by the 1940s it had been reified into a particular style that could be revived. It was perhaps no longer a coming together of cultures by this point, but um, by this point now it had its own rules and stylistic traits that could be replicated and conceptualised. In the 1930s, the big bands overshadowed Dixieland, but by the early 1940s, all the styles were returning to fashion. The popular recordings, beginning in 1942, of Chicago-based Dixieland bands led by Bunk Johnson are often cited as the catalyst for the revival of traditional jazz. Older black players, such as Johnson, trombonist Kid Ory, and clarinetist George Lewis, figured prominently in the revival. Younger black musicians avoided associating themselves with the past. That's interesting, isn't it? It seems like the younger ones want to live in the moment more, and the older ones want to just live in the past with that reified style that once was so in the moment and about coming together of cultures, but is now something that can be replicated. But this is just a speculation. In the years since, much of the music of the traditional revival of the 1940s, particularly that of Wilbur de Paris, Turk Murphy, Lou Waters, Art Hodes, and Chris Barber has proven to be one of great lasting value. Again, I'm sorry for mispronouncing everybody's name. Dixieland continued to be essential to the musical life of New Orleans, particularly during Mardi Gras time, and its traditions were carried on in later years by such popular New Orleans natives as clarinetist Pete Fountain and trumpeter Al Hert. Interesting. So what are the takeaway points from this little video on Dixieland jazz then? <laughs> For me, the takeaway points from this research is that Dixieland's origination involved the coming together of contrasting cultures, all of which were influenced by each other. We have the more regimented formal structures of classically trained musicians and the influence of marching bands, and we have the freer, more experimental contributions such as solo improvisation, bending notes, experimenting with pulse and rhythm. What's more is that New Orleans and Chicago were the central places where this form of jazz music developed. Even between New Orleans and Chicago there were contrasting stylistic traits and there also seems to be a comparison to be made between white musicians and black musicians. The white musicians were typically classically trained, more regimented, influenced by European styles and by marching bands whereas the black musicians were drawing on their ethnic inheritance and being more freer, improvising more, bending notes, being more experimental basically. So that's that. Stay tuned for the next video in this series where we'll be looking at Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, Jelly Roll Martin and Joe King and their contributions to the development of jazz music. 